and the extent to which they could be exploited by a hacker. These tests are typically performed using automated tools that look for specific weaknesses, technical flaws, or vulnerabilities to exploit. The results are presented to the system owner with an assessment of their risk to the networked environment and a remediation plan highlighting the steps needed to eliminate the exposures. Testing mimics the activity of the determined hacker. Procedures are tailored according to clients' specific needs and concerns, helping to increase cost effectiveness. Depth of penetration testing is determined by the client. Basic attempts of unauthorized access, website defacement, full-scale denial of service. Wireless network testing. McCann utilizes wireless equipment and tools to locate and assess wireless networks and rogue access points. We will review policies and procedures, architecture, configuration, and monitoring procedures for alignment with industry best practices. Discovery of all wireless access points and clients. McCann performs a site survey to discover all existing wireless access points and clients. McCann will also note any external wireless network whose signal range enters your premises. Optionally, McCann can map all access points to a floor plan if available. Validation of wireless network perimeter. One of the reasons wireless security is so complex is that wireless networks are not limited to the physical boundaries of your buildings. Using directional antennas, McCann maps the actual perimeter of your network that is vulnerable. We also provide advice on how to limit unnecessary exposure to the outside world. Vulnerability and penetration testing of access points. Using a variety of tools, McCann will sniff and capture ongoing wireless traffic and attempt to compromise the utilized encryption and break into wireless access points and clients. Configuration review of access points and wireless clients. McCann will review the configuration of wireless devices. We validate the configuration by comparing it against a random sampling of access points and clients to check that deployments are consistent with these guidelines. Social engineering testing. Social engineering is a term that describes the non-technical intrusion into an organization that relies on human interaction often involving tricking people in order to break normal security policies. Social engineering techniques include everything from phone calls with requests to people with administrative privileges to Trojans lurking behind email messages that attempt to lure the user into opening the attachments. External social engineering, phone calls targeting individuals from the help desk, ID department, human resources, or finance. Targeted email phishing attacks. Email sent to individuals enticing them to click on an external link. Malicious portable media. USB flash drives and CD-ROMs with enticing labels such as salaries left in public areas such as hallways, restrooms, and break rooms. Sensitive document disposal audit otherwise known as dumpster diving. McCann will search internal trash receptacles and external dumpster areas for sensitive documents. This concludes McCann Investigation's introduction to vulnerability assessments. I hope that you enjoyed this video. To learn more about McCann Investigations, please visit us on the web at www.mccanninvestigations.com. Okay, I think this is quite an instructive uh, video because it's a kind of company profile telling you what you need to do in order to evaluate the systems and to give you a package. The package includes the hardware testing as well as what we call human software testing. But one of the things I would like to bring to your attention is the very last element the lady mentions.
is what we call the social engineering testing. Social engineering is a very interesting term. First of all, is there anything in the engineering school which will be called social engineering? No. Social engineering is basically a term which we define to describe the kind of tricks people use in the context of conversations, particularly over the phone call to trick people or to cheat people to get some sensitive information. And we consider this as important because we discovered that nine out of ten cases normally when we discover why people would got this information to intrude our system because they got it directly from the people who got the information. Okay? So social engineering is a very interesting thing. We are going to go back and look at it. But today, I've just given you one of the many examples you can review on your own on what is meant by vulnerability assessment. In other words, a company will be paid to do something to check if the system at your organization is robust enough. Robust means strong enough to fend off attack. And they can tell you many different things. Okay? As you can see on the right hand side, they can also justify to you why you need to want a vulnerability assessment. Okay, the interesting question is do we need to do a vulnerability assessment on an individual basis? Well, I can think of a one very simple example. But I have three kids, they go to school, and the youngest kid always come back and ask me, Dad, I need a USB. Because I need a USB to plug into the school computer to store the files, the teachers gave it, and we need to do our homework there. And then, oftentimes, when the USB of my daughter is plugged into my computer, the antivirus software in my computer say, a lot of viruses. Never open those files. Then I ask her, where did you prop your USB in school? It's a new one I got you in the morning. When you come back home, it's, it's a USB full of viruses. I just plugged it in my school's computer. And I said, well, you better ask your, your school teacher to run a vulnerability assessment. And for me, I need to make sure that all the USB my daughter, my kids, my son use before I have Pop back to my computer, I have to ensure the virus free. Okay, because I put all of my US on the table to pick it up and go to school. So on an individual basis, if you have not been hard working enough, it's so easy for you to, to get track. Okay? Okay, having said that, let's come back here. So one more thing before I pass the time to Gia. So that is uh, week number five, okay? Let we go to week number six. It's a two-part series, okay? But uh, I think it's also meaningful because we still have nine minutes left. So let's go for the BBC Panorama. Okay. Oh, gee, you cut it off. Let's see, right here through the world. Let's see, that's too long. Right here? Yes, we do have the first one. Yeah, okay. Second one is there. Entire cities in the UK are now Wi Fi hotspots, 11 of them in all, and the number's growing. Liverpool, Manchester, Edinburgh, Brighton, the city of London. Some run by BT, others by a company called The Cloud. And when you're outdoors, the radiation is becoming increasingly difficult to avoid. Okay, let's see. Five miles outside Norwich, and not a sniff of a connection. 
in the suburbs a flicker and a signal, probably from people's home Wi-Fi routers. And in the city centre, there you go. It looks like we've got completely cable-free connectivity. But others would say this makes Norwich a city a virtual swan. Norwich was the first UK city to pilot a government-funded wireless network. In other cities, it's BT and the cloud charging users. But the government was so keen on Wi-Fi, it launched the Norwich service for free. You can see the mini-masts, or nodes, 200 of them in all, which sustain the network and create a pool of connectivity. We went around the city centre with a radiation monitor. Went to the red there. We're getting quite high readings here. They're about three or four times higher than we got on the mobile phone mark in the main beam of it, and the people are walking up and down here. They won't know it. And uh, I mean, it could be because of that. There's a little node up there on the top of the lamp post. It's something that's made their MP worried. He was a biologist and cancer specialist for 40 years before entering politics and feels his own party is now ignoring the advice they themselves commissioned. How seriously do you think the government's taking the precautionary approach right now with respect to Wi-Fi? Oh, I don't think there's any, any, any doubt about it. They're not at all Wi-Fi just being rolled out as a bit, bit white heat of technology. Industry rules in this area and uh, the precautionary principle and the safety of people who might benefit to some extent from the technologies are completely dismissed. It's just, it's wild west country for the companies. They just put them where they want and uh, say there's no evidence. Now, you know, five, ten years from now, as the evidence grows, there's enough now to be worried about, but as the evidence grows, who knows what it might show. It might show that it's completely unsafe for certain groups of people. But whilst the government races ahead, apparently unrestrained by its own chief advisor, others are more cautious. Switzerland, Italy, Russia, China, all have exposure limits thousands of times below ours. In Salzburg, the government advises against Wi-Fi in schools altogether. And there's something special happening in Sweden. We've flown in with our electrosensitive Sylvia, our government doesn't acknowledge her condition, but here, it's different. Deep in the Swedish woods, the hideaway of another woman called Sylvia. Hello. Hello. Welcome. If we you went right, can we come and have a look yeah. She's an electrosensitive too, and so are several of her friends. Can you feel anything here? I don't feel anything here. No, what I feel is just uh, me. Here, actually, I could just uh, think about other things, you know, it's just, just nice. It's just, uh, um, you know, I feel free. So when did the authorities here start acknowledging the existence of this? They did so in 2003. Uh, they, and they said this is uh, an official disability. A disability? Yes. The Swedish government estimates that 3% of the population suffer this disability. Translate that to the UK, and it's about 2 million people. Yet as far as our government's concerned, there are none. We set off for Stockholm, and Swedish Sylvia's city centre flat. She's plotted a route to avoid all the masks. She wants to show us just how seriously her government takes her condition. Like the UK, this is a place where more and more people are acquiring Wi-Fi, but there's a key difference. Okay, Sylvia. This is my living room. And today, the painter has been here. And you see, he has started painting black. And this is anti-radiation paint? Yes. It's quite expensive. It's very expensive. Anti-radiation paint, paid for by the local authority. It shields her from neighbours' Wi-Fi and from nearby phone masks. So the Swedes have the same scientific evidence, but they recognise sufferers. 
In Swedish schools, even if there's only one person apparently affected by Wi-Fi, the system's removed and the classroom shielded. You'd think that a government would base its decisions on the advice of their top man, the one it's employed to protect our health, Sir William Stewart. But instead, it seems to have turned to others. First, the World Health Organization. It's robust in its language, saying there are no adverse health effects from low-level, long-term exposure. Is that that? Now, I'm going to put you in the group-based discussions. You did not see the part one, okay? It's something about Wi-Fi, okay? It's something about Wi-Fi, all right? So I would like to talk among yourself, the members in your table, what the concerns are, okay? It's a little bit interesting, the discussions today, okay? And I just want to pause some table after five minutes to see if you got the points, okay? What do you get after this five minutes of watching this? What do you get? Actually, towards the end, you got the answer, but I want you to find out. It's a good classroom discussion exercise. It's not technical. You don't need any background, you just use your thinking based on what you saw in the past five minutes. What's the story all about? Alright? What's the story all about? You just watch about six minutes, okay? And of course, we can walk through, but the purpose is not for you to greet and watch them all. The purpose is to engage you in group-based discussions today, all right? What do you get? All right, you have five minutes time to talk about your the table. this page to what I'm going for. Do you understand what story are you reading six minutes ago? Yes. You need to ask questions about the members. Thank you. 
Christina, thank you. Gabriella, Gabriella, not yet today. Sonia, thank you. Tina, thank you. Cleo, thank you. Joey, thank you. Winnie, thank you. Xiao Wei, thank you. Danny, thank you. Nicholas, thank you. Gala, thank you. Blue, thank you. Karim, thank you. Ming Xian, thank you. Louise, thank you. Raymond, thank you. Steve Zhao, thank you. Levine, Levine, not here today, okay. Second page. Cerulean, thank you. Martin, thank you. Fred, thank you. Michelle, thank you. Fatima, thank you. Heidi, thank you. Karen, thank you. Erica, thank you. Yoga, thank you. Gethel, thank you. Winner, thank you. Winner is over there, yes. Ada, thank you. Steve Chen, Steve, thank you. Gia, thank you. Khan, thank you. Hannah, thank you. Thank you very much. Now since we have one minute left, the exercise is to help you to understand when you become a self-regulated learner, what do you need to pick up? Okay? I just read to you the first sentence and you use the remaining paragraph to interpret what you used to be doing when you're doing self-regulated learning. It's not a mental ability or an academic performance skill, so you don't need to worry much about that. Self-regulation, it's the self-directed process, okay, by which you and I transform our mental abilities into academic skills. Uh, that is very important. Rather, self-regulation is a self-directed process. Each one of us is capable of doing that because we know what to do. By which, when you know what you're going to do, you can transform your mental abilities into academic skills. When I invite you to think about what the story is concerning Wi-Fi it's all about. I did not give you the first half. I did not let you finish the beginning of the story. I just asked you to think about what the story is all about. When you see the lady pointing to the ceiling and telling the people it's very expensive for me to paint those anti-radiation paints. Why is the lady doing all of these? Because according to the study there, it's easy for people to get cancer when we are exposed to this continuous streams of radiations coming up from devices like this. So this is a small device, but if you live next to the CDM building in Taipei or in Macau, but next to those high rise building, you better watch for it. Okay, normally in a matter of two to three years, if you are holding your mobile phone so close to your ear, yeah. evidence tells us people got brain tumors because of that. Okay, now invention. What can you learn from that? Self-regulations for you is that you have to activate your self-directed process, in which each one of you should have the capability to transform your mental ability to think into your academic skills. Alright? So, read the remaining of the paragraph and understand a little bit more about SRL. Okay, Jia, may I invite you to come here to do the sharing for us? Alright? Thank you very much. We have Jia. Today's sharing, I want to share something about
You point out some very good points about privacy, and you argue about no, I do not believe privacy is dead because of the following. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stop sharing, that was very meaningful. Would you please make sure you go back to the link and type up what you shared? Thank you very much. Now, uh, I think it's very important for me to remind you it is highly recommended you do not just come here alone. When you sign up for the next round of sharing, come here as a peer. You have a peer partner. So when you have a peer partner coming to talk for the whole class, you can have conversations. And the conversation between the two of you here makes a lot of sense for us to listen. And we might want to ask more questions. So remember, you're not here to provide answers. You're here to provide questions, to stimulate the discussions of your concern so that you can collect possible answer from the rest of this classroom, okay? That is what sharing is all about. You do not need to make sure you have every single answer, as long as your question good enough to make people think that's very important, okay? So I'm going to see you back here on Thursday with the result of your midterm course survey, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about learning contract number three. Okay, the task force, which contains two teams, and what you need to be prepared. Thank you very much. See you back here at my first time.